more comprehensive view, we're fortunate to have with us today Andrea Auerbach, who is the Managing Director and Head of Private uh, Equity Research at Cambridge Associates, not to be confused with Cambridge Analytica, which, which has been uh, <laughs> harvesting data from Facebook. Uh, Cambridge Associates is one of the, if not the leading research and investment consulting firms in the country to investors of all types around the globe. Andrea holds, heads the U.S. private equity research team, which performs due diligence uh, on investment opportunities in private equity, mezzanine, and distressed debt markets. And prior to joining Cambridge Associates in 2001, she was a senior director at Prudential Private Equity and has a long and distinguished career in private capital. She earned a BA degree in economics from Smith College and an MBA from the Harvard Business School. Andrea, we thank you so much for joining us today and making the trip to Chapel Hill to speak to our friends and investors at Plexus Capital. Thank you, Andrea. This little clicker right here, you got it? Thanks. I, that was the first time I've ever heard myself described as having a long and distinguished career. I think I need a drink now. Um, thank you very much. It's a, real, it's a real pleasure to be here and share some of the data that uh, my firm collects and uses to advise our clients on making investments in, in, in this private space. And as Kel mentioned, I've spent basically my entire career here and started out when LBOs were actually called leveraged buyouts, no longer. Now they're private equity. It's a much more euphemistic phrase. Uh, seems more harmless than harmful. Um, but we've got, a lot, we've got a lot of interesting angles, and so really wanted to walk you through sort of how we see private capital and the space today. And some of the comments you've already heard, which is a lot of the public markets are, are going passive, and in order to find a compelling return in any portfolio, thinking more aggressively about adding private capital exposure and dealing with the illiquidity that that would represent for you as an investor is something worth considering. Okay. All right. So to sort of set the table for you, um, this slide shows on the left-hand side public, uh, uh, public um, equity and some bonds in um, investment opportunities. These are the long-only equity and, and fixed income strategies on the left. And on the right, as you cross over from purple to orange to green, you're walking through hedge funds, real estate, private equity on a global basis, and then venture capital. And what I want to point out to you is that in, in, a, low, in a low return environment and in a, in a public equity market that is continuing to commoditize, earning an outsized return through a, a long only um, option is basically continuing to get competed away. And so these black diamonds that you see are the manager median, the median return. So the C plus manager in the long only space, most of those diamonds are under the median, the median manager on the, on the alternative asset strategies on the right-hand side. What's more interesting to me and why I've spent my entire career in the space is that the dispersion of return that you see in the private markets is extensive, right? Manager selection is key, as, they, as we like to say all the time. And so it's very possible to embed yourself with certain managers in the private capital space that have a sustainable competitive advantage and can earn a 35% net return for their investors, right? That's, that's venture, right? That's the, that's, the, uh, that's the hot stuff. In global private equity, that top fifth percentile is 21.6. And that median return is actually better than the top fifth percentile of those long only strategies. So the middle of the road private capital manager is better than the best long only manager, right? Worth considering the illiquidity to get access to that level of dispersion. You know, the other thing I'll mention here is, is that I don't really think of private equity or private capital as there are no averages, there is no index hugging. Look at the dispersion on the slide, right? When you think about it, it has a lot of industrial logic to it. You're investing in a, in a team that is very specific talent, skills, culture, attributes. They're building a certain kind of competitive advantage facing the market, and it's what they do with their investments that makes a difference. There's very little overlap of that portfolio with any other manager's portfolio in a private capital context. So the dispersion that you see there will persist. And so to talk about private capital as an average would really be, uh, I think, a, a false precision because there's a lot of unique portfolios being built across the private capital landscape. 
and it's who you're selecting to add your capital to will make the difference in your return as an investor. So I like to say this in front of my long only colleagues, for return seekers, only private investing remains. Now, what does that mean within our client base? And this is an interesting slide that Michael and I were talking about, which is if you're really going to leg into private investments, right? And you've heard it already said within the Plexus context, which is, which is it can take five to seven years to see the results from the investments that are being made on a day one. It takes time to create an upward glide path to build a meaningful exposure to private investments. And so this is the average allocation to private investments for endowments and foundations. We advise families, we advise endowments, foundations, pensions, pretty much the gamut. But what you can see here from 1990 to 2016, it took decades to work the endowment and foundation space, a group that is built to exist in perpetuity. Their version of the long run is hundreds of years. Private investments feels a liquid for seven years. These folks are built to last for hundreds of years, and it's taken them decades to get up to an average allocation of 20%. Um, so it's important to think about building in that exposure over time. Markets go up, markets go down, you can guarantee that. Um, and so you really need to have a certain glide path upwards to add this kind of exposure. Now there's one other piece of information I'll add here. And so we, we do, we advise on all asset strategies. I just happen to live in private capital land, which is where I like to be. Um, we ran a study of our best performing endowments and foundations. And we were regressing their performance against certain attributes. And what we found was that our very best performing institutional investors had at least a 15% allocation to private investments. That was one of the key determinants of how they did over time. And I believe that to be the case because if you think about the dispersion of return and the manager selection capabilities one can build or simply accumulate over time, you can capture some of that upside for the benefit of your program, hence this long march upwards. I also think the commoditization of the public equity markets is also driving more and more capital into the privates, as we just heard from Cal. So, a little bit more markety information for you. Let's chat about the markets really quick. I think the, the, the fire slide, uh, I think, said it all. It's super toppy right now, super, super toppy. And so what you're looking at on this slide is the average purchase price multiple is the green line rolling across the, the, uh, the page. The average leverage multiple is the orange. And then fundraising for just US private equity are the blue bars. One of the things I observe here, and this goes from 2002 to 2017, there's a suspension bridge format to the capital raising in this space because investors go in heavy, then they come back out, then they come back in. The purchase prices have definitely been moving a little up and down, but they've been very, very elevated. Now, what I'm gonna mention again is, this is these are averages, right? That green line is an average, it's from the LCD comp set. I think it might be Companies with 50 million of EBITDA or less, that's a huge category, right? So what we like to do at CA is sort of peel the onion on that and go, all right, yes, it looks toppy. What does this mean going forward? And I've got a few slides coming up to show you how we might peel that, peel that apart. Now, all this capital coming into the market is a concerning dry powder, right? We talked about that. Is there going to be an avalanche of dry powder in the market? And I would argue it depends on where you look which kind of can bring, which brings us to the Plexus context. But first, let's just talk about how much dry powder is there. Okay, there's a lot. There's about $437 billion of dry powder waiting to get deployed into the US private equity market. That's a lot of money. We've sorted it by fund size, which I think makes it much more interesting, which is if you look at the largest funds who obviously raise a lot of money, those largest funds, funds of five billion or more, are sitting on 200 billion of capital right now. They need to go buy something. The clock is ticking for them as well. Funds between 1 billion and 5 billion are sitting on about 177 billion of dry powder. But where I'm looking is funds less than a billion, okay? And that's a pretty big bright line, I know. But in order to just try to carve it out in some basic buckets, take a close look. The overhang for funds of less than a billion is 61 billion. Yes, that's big dollars. However, it's also pretty small relative to where that dry powder bucket has stood over time. How do I dissect this? And what I'm watching as I talk to the, the hundreds of managers I meet every year, and my team as well globally, which is the larger funds are looking to buy things from the smaller funds, and they're definitely going lower and lower in what they're willing to look at and do, and they're willing to pay more and more to get it done, right? 
So the larger funds are coming down and, and buying things from smaller funds. They're also competing with smaller funds for deals. They really feel the pressure to put that capital to work. Um, from an investment standpoint, how do I view this? One, there always has to be some amount of dry powder. You don't want your fund to put all the money into the market in one year. That's not good from an investment standpoint. You want time diversification, which is something we've heard about this morning. So there's some amount of that $437 billion that should be there. There might be a little extra that's not helping anything <laughs> um, and maybe pushing the supply of capital into bad corners. But where I think the market is, is probably getting more oversupplied is in the upper registers of the market. The lower middle market functions very regularly and even did the global financial crisis put a pause on everything, but for the most part, M&A activity and other things started rolling first in the lower middle market and things kind of kept moving. And that's where we like to spend a lot of our investment time is in the lower middle market, which is funds way below a billion, by the way. Just had to use larger categories for today. Okay. Now, we talked about um, returns to some extent, valuations, capital in the market, what's that dry powder going to do, where are the returns today, okay? And this slide, which we've titled, look lower for outperformance, larger for less loss. I call this the friend, size is the frenemy of performance slide. We took all the data we've collected on U.S. private equity and, and, and U.S. private equity funds, so not private capital as in capital solutions providers, but private equity. We buy typically control, control stakes in companies and we manage them. And we took all these funds across a multi-decade period and then we sorted them by fund size. So what you're looking at is on the left-hand side of the slide are funds of 200 million or less and the dispersion of their returns and then 200 to 500 five to one and a half billion, one and a half billion to five, and then greater than five billion is way out there on the right. What's pretty obvious is you can see that the dispersion of return, which is the upside potential in actual return, and of course, unfortunately, the downside, basically starts to constrict the larger you get. Makes sense. It's hard to take 24 billion and, and do it three times on that um, because you, you really, your set of options that you can invest in is significantly smaller than a lower middle market fund that can trundle through source opportunities on a na nationwide basis, apply some English to the business development and value creation plan, and come out the other end with a 3x. And so when we, look, when we look at the lower middle market, we're looking to cut off managers that don't have an established strategy, sustainable competitive advantage, pretty clear processes for risk management, et cetera. If, if there are certain elements that are missing when we're meeting a manager, we think they're going to be in the bottom half of that distribution and we avoid them. We're more focused on those that we believe have the potential to succeed and deliver that outperformance that you see in the blue bars on the slide. So we're looking lower for outperformance, larger for less loss. And so the frenemy comment is just that the larger funds tend to deliver some amount of performance regardless. And if you think about it, it's because they are buying the largest companies with battle-proof capital structures. Someone's going to buy them. Uh, there will be an exit. And so that's another interesting element of large cap buyouts, particularly as we're heading into maybe the, the end stages of a, of a market cycle. So one more thought for you. OK, let's talk about lower middle market a little bit more. So we collect data on about 5,000 different private equity-backed companies, and we've been doing it and have data going back 10 years. So let's compare lower middle market companies to larger companies to public companies, okay? If you're looking for growth, and by the way, growth, some, so we have new analysis we're working on right now, which shows that growth is very much an element of, of return, and that if your company is growing, the chances of someone wanting to buy it is much higher than if it's not. Feels obvious, we are busy proving the data behind that. And so what you see here is that smaller companies, which is the dark blue bar, are clearly growing faster than larger private equity backed companies. And those lower middle market private equity companies are clearly growing faster than the Russell 2500 companies. People are going to want and come and buy those companies. Large cap private equity, I got some concerns for you. Luckily, none of you are in this room. Um, that kind of growth for a control buyout of 3.2% is, I would say, anemic. And what's your value creation strategy there? But we'll save that for a different conference. Okay. Valuations. So I showed that that 10 and a half, that 10 and a half times average EBITDA multiple line on, the, um, on a slide a few, a, a few clicks back. But if you peel the onion on this, 
what you see is that for lower middle market companies, the average purchase price is about, at least the data, the 5,000 company data set we're using, is about 7.9 times. Larger companies in private equity land are trading at 10.1, 10.5 on average, and the Russell 2500 over this time period trading at 10.3 times EBITDA on average. So if you're buying, if you're in the lower middle market and you grow your company, you're probably gonna get picked up for let's hope 10 times, knock wood, and have a fantastic exit driven by the interest level that's coming from large cap private equity. So we, we've seen it. We know there are better valuations in the lower middle market, and we think that will benefit investors in the lower, lower middle market because large cap private equity is coming, they need to buy things, and you can capture some of that arbitrage. What I would say right now in the market, it feels like every, every fund of every size is capturing some of this arbitrage. It's not going to last, but it's much more sustainable in the lower middle market. So, okay. Um, just two more slides. Um, the, way I, the way I see the world, I guess, with my long and distinguished career is when I started, when I started as a wee, as a wee lass, um, I started in the LBO group at Peru, and this was the world, right? And th by the way, this bell curve, there's no data used to create this bell curve. It's for illustration purposes only. But most of the capital way back in the day basically went to plain vanilla private equity, right? And the company trajectory, the x-axis the x -axis here is, look, if you had a company that was kind of growing at GDP plus or minus, wasn't really doing too much, you bought it, you levered it up to 90%, which is true, and you hope nothing went wrong. Um, when, at my old shop, we bought an American pen company and did that. People need to write at the time, so it kind of worked out. Um, if you wanted companies that were growing faster than GDP or GDP++, you'd look to the right and do venture capital. And then if you wanted to do something a little more neutral or you were more downside oriented, you might go do mezzanine or you might pursue distressed. This was the world for a really long time and a very successful world at that. Um, if I fast forward to today, it's crazy out there, right? Um, and so what's happened is that plain vanilla space is getting squeezed because that's not good enough to earn a compelling return for investors today. You need a sustainable competitive advantage in order to win. Otherwise, the returns that you're generating are, are not going to last. They won't persist, right? There's a lot of concern and we can more than welcome to have that sidebar conversation. Um, but when we look at the space, it's completely evolved and continues to evolve. There's now there's growth equity, right? Growth buyouts, what is that, right? Sector-focused investing, which we, uh, we have a real thesis rolling in. Buy and build is its own thing at this point completely. Operational private equity, which is really focusing on those heavy lifts. Private credit, which is its own space, and I could do a whole bell curve on private credit alone. Uncorrelated, and all the UFOs you see hovering on the outside are emergent strategies where there's multiple managers, multiple funds plying their trough there where we've got eyes on them and thinking about, do you deserve a place on the bell curve? But it, it's a very complicated, it, it's a complicated space. It continues to expand. That dispersion of return that I talked about will also continue to persist. And just focusing on those managers that have been delivering performance in a consistent way and continue to evolve along with this market should, should really be beneficial to your programs provided you're at least 15% in privates, because I need, I need to keep being employed. So, But thank you very much. Very much appreciated your time. I'm taking a couple questions, putting you on the spot okay, while we've got you. I'll take a question. Anybody have any questions for Andrea while we've got her? Over here. What, what was the right amount of dry powder? How do you take that and give some guidance as to what's right? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's kind of like, uh, I think of it as the way I would actually calculate it, which I haven't done in my head on the fly, um, which would be transaction, equity transaction volume with a leverage multiple divided, in, you know, divided into that. Three years, three years. And actually, right now, we're very concerned because the velocity of, of capital deployment is increasing in certain corners of the market. So quick red flag is if you have a manager that's fully deployed in 12 to 18 months, I view that as a red flag. But I think three years-ish of dry powder is good. I haven't taken a measure on my concern of this amount. So. This will be a good one. <laughs> Greg Brown. So the question on, um, you talk about the importance of manager selection, obviously, with the, with the explosion of the number of funds and firms, a lot of those coming from people 
people coming out of other firms and stuff. I mean, how have you guys thought about uh, that identification process getting more difficult and complicated? Right. So the question is, fundraising activity um, and new fund formation seems to be spiking. I, it, and how do you get a handle on that? Yeah, how do you find good managers? When the, it might be the firm, it might be the manager, and there's a lot of, to, to find that skill is not obvious. That's very, that's a, yes. So the, the question about how do you figure out from this massive roster of potentials which one, and, and this is where I, unfortunately, I don't have a great answer for newbies. Um, I've been at this for a long and distinguished amount of time. I've met, I've met a lot of managers along the way, and Cambridge collects data on 18,000 different partnerships. So if someone's gonna say, hey, I'm raising a new fund, hopefully, uh, hopefully you, me, your advisor, will have been in the room and watched the truth unfold over the last couple of years, or will have the data to go back to to verify. Now, if you don't have any of that to your, to your hand, um, actually, and it was great to have all the CEOs introduced, go talk to the CEOs of the companies that whomever's track record is being presented to you. CEOs typically are truth tellers without the lasso. They're pretty good. That's how I would do it. Um, Christy? We, we lean on data hard though. Yes. Uh, so Add-on acquisitions and operational improvements being the, the new, there's no more financial engineering, right? This, the lower middle market, that's how it's playing out. Hold yeah. periods are obviously moving longer. Are you advising your clients that their lower middle market portfolio IRR should be less going forward because of that? Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, actually, let's, uh, let me just sneak back one slide or two slides. That's, it's a great question, Chrissy. Yeah, so the average hold period in private equity is roughly six to seven years regardless of, regardless of size. The, the add on, so the add on acquisition strategy that we are seeing pursued aggressively, which by the way is a great strategy in a flat returning market. If you have to buy companies that aren't necessarily growing, you manufacture the growth out of whole cloth by buying other companies, right? And it does take time to affect that strategy. Um, I think our concerns, our concerns are generally that there's overall pressure on return in private equity based on everyone wants to get into the space. There is larger, larger funds are raising more money and kind of bringing down, I think, return potential in the upper registers. Um, in the lower middle market, extending through add-ons, I haven't, I, haven't I, I haven't peeled that element back to see if it's materially different for, say, a, a classic add-on acquisition manager versus a regular organic grower to see if there's truly a difference. Um, it's a, it's, it's a great question, and, and I hadn't seen anything that indicated it was material enough to be detrimental to performance. But, um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you.